Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenn Booth, and I'm chair of the Black History Month Organizing Committee at the University of Toronto. On behalf of the committee, I would like to say thank you for joining us today to celebrate our 20th anniversary lunch on this, the last day of Black History Month. This is our second year of hosting a virtual lunch. And as I said last year, which of course I did not think I would be saying again this year, we might not have food to eat, but we definitely have some food for thought. I have to be honest with you today. I really miss standing on the podium at the Great Hall at Hart House and looking out over the hall and seeing a rainbow cross section of people looking back at me. So today I take the time out to say thanks to all of you for the years of support and for joining us today, because I know that rainbow of people are still with us today. I would also like to say thank you to the over 20,000 kids and students across the GTA schools and their teachers who have joined us today for this very special thank you. From the early years, a diverse group who were an essential part of the foundation years of this event supported the event and the spirit of inclusiveness continues today. So to all the volunteers, to all the BIPAC members, to all my LGBT plus friends, to all the women, to all the, my friends who are white or brown, please know that we appreciate your support over the years, we recognize your support, and we thank you for your support. We have used various venues across campus over the years, and I would like to quickly acknowledge the University College, Woodsworth College, and Hart House for the use of their facilities over the years. We also wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, <clears throat> this meeting is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to, to work on this land. So participating in today's program, we have our guests of honor, six-time Olympic champion and gold medalist, Andre DeGrasse, and his mother, Beverly DeGrasse. We have guest appearances by the Ontario First Poet Laureate, Randell Ajay. We have an appearance by an actress and singer from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air fame, Tatiana Ali. We have appearances by employees of a returning lead sponsor, Ear Canada. We have appearances and remarks by a wide cross-section of the university's senior management. We have some entertainment. We have prizes and giveaways, courtesy of Tim Horton's restaurant owners. We also have our traditional Black History Month lunch and quizzes, which also some were giveaways. We have some fundraising, donations going to a newly created fund, of which Vice President Palmer will talk to us a little bit more later on. We also have an option of two Air Canada airline tickets to anywhere in the world that Canada, Air Canada flies. As we have traditionally done, we will start the program with the singing of the Black National Anthem. Londa Larmond is a Canadian award-winning Juno-nominated gospel singer who has also performed in the film, The Blues Brothers. To sing the Black National Anthem, please welcome Londa Larmond to be followed by a kid's version of the anthem.
Thank you, Londa, for that rendition of the anthem, and thank you for the kids for their um, interpretation of the anthem. The University of Toronto is the largest university in Canada, and it is consistently ranked in the top, both in North America and internationally. In fact, one recent poll placed the University of Toronto at the number two spot for public universities in North America. So it makes sense that the president of the university is pretty busy. However, during his tenure, this president has consistently made timely schedule to be a part of this luncheon. It is a testament to his commitment to the values that, it, that this lunch represents. It is also a testament to the commitment of senior members of the president's office, people like Nadina Jameson. I would now like to welcome President Merrick Gertler of the University of Toronto, Professor of Geography and Planning, and the Gold Ring Chair in Canadian Studies to make opening remarks on behalf of the university. Thank you, Glenn, for your kind introduction and for the commitment and energy you give to this event each year. Good afternoon, everyone. A special thank you to Andre de Grasse, six-time Olympic medalist, philanthropist, and role model, whom we're honoring today. And a very warm welcome to Andre's mother, Beverly de Grasse, who will be accepting his award and saying a few words on his behalf. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the University of Toronto's Black History Month luncheon. It's also the second year we've had to host the event online because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's wonderful to see how, despite the online format, it still brings people and cultures together to celebrate Black History Month and community leaders, and U of T's black community in particular. But I have to say, I am really looking forward to the return of the in-person format, since the food at this event is always absolutely fantastic. The University of Toronto is recognized as Canada's leading university and one of the top universities on the planet. A big part of what distinguishes us from our global peers is our commitment to inclusive excellence. We recognize that great ideas are the product of diverse perspectives and that talent can come from any postal code. As the university's statement on equity, diversity, and excellence makes clear, we strive to be an equitable and inclusive community, rich with diversity, protecting the human rights of all persons. To that end, in November, I joined counterparts at universities and colleges across Canada in signing the Scarborough Charter. It's an historic initiative to fight anti-black racism and promote black inclusion on our campuses. And we can all be very proud that members of the U of T community have played a leading role in its development. I'm also delighted to share some news with you today in recognition of the importance of our Black History Month luncheon. In celebration of its two decades of growth and success, we have created a new endowed fund to benefit a black undergraduate student at U of T who is in need of financial support. David Palmer will tell us more later in our program. But let me take this opportunity to thank all those involved in this exciting new initiative. Thank you all for joining us today. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you enjoy the celebration. And now, without further ado, I'm honored to introduce the Afro Beats Band. Who 
Thank you, Afro Beats Band, and uh, thank you, President Gertler, for those remarks. And I will quickly uh, just um, say to people who are interested in the meaning of the um, lyrics for that uh, particular song, I mean, you can do a quick Google search. It basically was done during the height of the pandemic, and it relates to the um, temporary nature of, um, of our of your homeland um, when in the midst of all that um, tragedy that was happening during the during the middle of the pandemic. But please do a quick Google search to, to for, for better context and background. Over the past few years, the Division of University Advancement, as a matter of fact, all during the time of the lunch, which is the place where I work, has been the lead sponsor from the University of this luncheon. As such, we have received generous support from the senior management team at the division. And I would like to say to them at this point publicly, thank you for your support over the years. And as a matter of fact, most of the members of the team at some point have actively participated in this event. The next presenter is a member of the advancement senior management team. I would now like to welcome Jillian Morrison, Assistant Vice President, University Development,
to welcome and recognize our community and to thank our sponsors and supporters. Jillian. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Black History Month is a cherished occasion in the U of T calendar. The lunch is a capstone to all the many ways we recognize and celebrate Black History Month here at U of T. And I know we're all particularly delighted to be here this year as part of the 20th year of this wonderful event. Huge congratulations to Glenn Booth and all the volunteers who have sustained this tradition for 20 years. 20 years is an incredible milestone. I want to say a huge thanks as well to the volunteer team for their efforts to ensure that even though we aren't able to gather in person to enjoy delicious food, inspiring music and warm fellowship, we're still able to be together virtually. Now, I've been asked to acknowledge a number of participants and special guests, so let me get on with these important duties. First, I want to thank our sponsors this year. Air Canada is our lead sponsor, and we're joined by many Air Canada employees this afternoon. And our second sponsor is Toronto Tim Hortons Restaurant Owners. Thank you to both of our sponsors for your tremendous support of the program. I want to say a special thank you also to our guests of honour, Beverly DeGrasse, Andre DeGrasse, and Andre's team. We're delighted to share that two of our past guests of honor are with us here today, and we send a special welcome to MPP Mitzi Hunter and NHL Vice President Kim Davis. This year, today, as always, we have tremendous support and participation from U of T's leadership, beginning with President Merrick Gertler and Chancellor Rose Patton. Thank you to President Gertler and Chancellor Patton for your support. Also with us are the leadership of University of Toronto Scarborough and the University of Toronto Mississauga. So we send a special welcome to UTM Vice President and Principal Alexandra Gillespie and UTSC Vice President and Principal Wisdom Teddy. A special thanks to you, Wisdom, for your outstanding leadership in the creation of the Scarborough Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion in Canadian Higher Education, which was signed last fall. We're also pleased to welcome Vice Principal academic and dean at UTM, Rhonda McEwen. Rhonda is a member of the steering committee of U of T's Black Research Network, which promotes Black excellence at U of T and aims to enhance the research capacity of Black scholars at U of T and on the world stage. Thank you so much for being with us, Rhonda. Special thanks also to Hard House Warden John Monahan, a huge supporter of the lunch, and Woodsworth College Principal Carol Chin. And of course, we want to thank everyone who's made time to be part of the 20th annual Black History Month lunch, including staff and students from Toronto, Peel, York, Durham, and Greater Toronto Area School Boards, City of Toronto staff, employees from Puma Canada, members of our alumni community joining us from their homes here in Toronto and around the world, and U of T faculty, staff, and students from all three campuses. Our U of T community is a large, diverse, and powerfully impactful community. The members of that community make countless daily contributions to the world in a myriad of disciplines. We're thrilled that in today's gathering, we're joined by members of every corner of this community, especially those dedicating themselves to advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion. The pandemic has reaffirmed for all of us the importance of keeping in touch, sustaining our connections with each other, and remaining involved with our community. And so in closing, I want to say a special final thanks to the organizing committee led by Glenn Booth, who are helping us all to stay connected through their efforts to continue the lunch tradition. So welcome everyone today. Thank you for celebrating with us and for contributing to our vibrant University of Toronto community. Thank you, Gillian, for those remarks. Air Canada has played an integral role in the growth of our event over the years. And we're delighted that they agreed to join us again, not only as sponsor, but as donors. Please welcome representatives from the airline, Damar Walker, First Officer Norman Houghton, Director of IFEC, who have graciously offered their time and experience to U of T's PhD student from the Flow Control and Experimental Turbulence Lab at the Institute for Aerospace Studies here at the university, Marinus Okoronko. Please take a look at this conversation between the Air Canada reps 
and our aerospace PhD student. My name is Marinus Okoronkwa and I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. I'm grateful for this opportunity to ask you these interview questions for the celebration of Black History Month and I look forward to hearing your interesting answers. So my first question is this, did you always want to be a pilot? How and when did you know that you wanted to be a pilot? So I've always wanted to uh, become a pilot. And I realized this uh, when my family was migrating from Jamaica to Canada, and I had the opportunity to visit a flight deck. And I saw the pilots, I saw the work environment, all the gauges, switches, and dials. And I, I pretty much instantly fell in love with uh, aviation at, at that point. And I knew that I, I wanted to become a pilot. I see from your LinkedIn profile that you were the um, head of ports at APM terminals in Kingston, Jamaica. So I would um, assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that you probably came here to Canada as an adult, as a professional. So I want to know how did you navigate this um, migration when you moved over here? What were the peculiar challenges you faced? and? How did you surmount these challenges as a black immigrant in Canada? Yeah, so I migrated to Canada back in 2008, actually December 25th, 2008. Uh, I had a girlfriend at the time, uh, which is now my wife, that is of Jamaican heritage. So the transition uh, for me wasn't um, as onerous as, you know, some people uh, uh, have while migrating to Canada, you know, coming here fresh with nobody. Uh, to support or help culturally. Um, however, uh, obviously, as a black man moving to a country uh, where, you know, the tables have flipped a bit, where now I'm in the minority in terms of representation compared to the majority uh, from where I was, it was, you know, quite a sh culture shock, um, you know, seeing how a society where black people are the minority operated. But, you know, for me, um, I've experienced the same challenges uh, anybody else um, would have uh, experienced coming in here as a minority. And I would say, you know, going through the struggles of racism, um, prejudice, all those things are going to be true and you just have to persevere. And that's what we did. But I did it with the help of my community, my wife, my family. Uh, they all helped me through uh, the whole ordeal to get to where I'm at today. Do you, or at any point in your career, did you ever feel like, oh, I'm not good enough, these people are doing such great things and I'm doing nothing, I'm not working hard enough, I'm not smart enough. And how did you, or how did you deal with that? Yeah, the imposter, the good old imposter syndrome, it, it's a thing. Um, and yes, I have experienced that. And you know, when you're the only one that looks like you in a room, that's something, that's a feeling that you're gonna, that's gonna come up, right? You, 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 naturally, your body and your brain is gonna evoke uh, an emotion that makes you feel like you're out of place. But I think what we have to remember is within the broader society, we make decisions for everybody, right? Regardless of what job you're in or what role you're in uh, or what level you're at in, in a company, the decisions you make don't impact a specific, a specific race or creed. You're making decisions that will impact the lives of everyone. So as long as you remember that, uh, you'll know that the decisions you're making uh, are impacting everybody, people that look like you, people that look like others. Uh, I think, you know, it will help to dilute that imposter syndrome um, uh, that you may experience because you're there for a reason. And the value that you add isn't simply just uh, uh, the intellectual property that lives in your head, but that level of diversity that ensures that you're taking care of not just people that look like you, but for everybody else. I would like to ask, how did you build and leverage the network that helped you to get to where you are today? Okay, so th this is a famous question with respect to networking, and I feel the most honest answer that I can give is when you're networking, 
is to take interest in building positive and genuine relationships. Vice approaching networking from an opportunistic standpoint where you're just trying to get something or go somewhere um, from networking with someone. And I think for me, I built genuine relationships with mentors from early on and I really cared about the jobs that they did and I was very curious about how they did those jobs and in building an interest in that, building relationships, long lasting relationships, I'm still good friends with one of my mentors, Derek Baxter from uh, a different airline in, in North America. And you know what, I, I keep up to date with him. I let him know what I'm doing with my career, where I've been in my career, and I've kept him up to date all along the way. So I feel the best way to networking is, is to focus on the relationship standpoint of networking vice, how you can benefit from networking. Thank you, Air Canada, for that segment. Before I introduce the next presenter, it's time to talk about the Black History Month luncheon quiz. Traditionally, we ask one Black history related question and the winner with the correct answer gets a prize. This here, we have two questions and two individual winners. And the prize this year is a $100 gift certificate from Tim Hortons. So here are the Black History Month questions for this year. This first question is a nod to our lead sponsor. And here we go. Which athlete while playing in Canada was popularly nicknamed Air Canada. The second question is, and this is a nod to our guest of honor, Andre. Here's a question. What is the name of the last Canadian athlete before Andre de Grasse to win gold medal in the Olympic 200 meters sprint? So the last 200 meters Olympic sprint winner, Canadian before Andre. So for those answers, please email your answers to bhml at utoronto for a chance to win your gift card. In addition to these two questions, this year, the Andre de Grasse Foundation has generously donated another gift certificate for $100 to answer this question. And as per the foundation, this question is for school students only. This is a research question, but it's pretty simple. For you students out there, you need to go to the University of Toronto website and find the names of two senior members of the university who are people of color. So go to the website, find the names of two people of color, <clears throat> senior members, of the University of Color. Not, not only that, makes it a little bit more difficult. Of those two people of color, one of the senior member should be non-Black, but a member of the BIPOC community. So a person of color who is a senior member of the university, but who is non-Black. That is from the Grass Foundation for gift certificate winner of $100. Please email your answers to bhml.utoronto.ca. The winners will be drawn and announced later. So now let's introduce the next presenter. The Anti-Racism and Cultural, Office, Cultural and Diversity Office at the University of Toronto has a broad mandate to enable the university's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusivity. In the present climate, this is one of the most defining issues being addressed at both the university and the community, and the community at large. To talk about some of, the universities, some, of, some of the university's initiatives in this space, please welcome the director of ArtCo, Jody Glean. Hello, everyone. 
Thank you to Glenn and the organization committee for your continued work and efforts in creating an annual space at the university that allows us to center and celebrate Black joy and excellence in our honoring of Black History Month. I invite us all to truly center this word joy, with joy being defined as happiness without a reason. When I think about the meaning of Black History Month, it means focusing on the brilliance and majesty of Black peoples. It means deepening the learning and reconnection to Black history that predates colonialism and slavery. While this month offers ongoing opportunities to identify the ongoing fight against anti-Black racism, we must do so in centering the care and wellness of ourselves, families, and communities. Throughout the waves of social justice movements, Black communities within their intersectionalities resound the calls loudly to be seen. See us for all who we are and for all that we experience. Our advocacies must address the unique experiences of racial violence for Black women, LGBTQ plus identified communities, persons with different abilities, mature and younger generations of Black folks, Black Muslim and Jewish community members, and the many identities that lead to simultaneous experiences with varied forms of discrimination and oppression. We must continue to center the joy, stories, and excellence of all of who we are. The University of Toronto continues to work alongside its stakeholders and partners to address systemic anti-Black racism. As we recognize the one-year anniversary of the launch of the Anti-Black Racism Task Force report, we do this in honoring the many champions who have worked and continue to work tirelessly to identify barriers and to foster inclusive environments across our tri-campus. I think about community members such as Ike Okafor, Sandra Carnegie Douglas, Amarel Sanders, Kimberly Tull, Dr. Wisdom Tete, Dr. Trotz, Dr. Rhonda McEwen, Lydia Gill, Glenn, past and present student leaders, administrative and faculty members, uh, including members of Connections and, Con and Connections and Conversations, and all who engage in critical mentorship and community work that often go unnoticed. We see you and we thank you. The university will continue to honor its commitments to the Anti-Black Racism Report and to the values of the Scarborough Charter to address the barriers and to deepen Black inclusion in a systemic way. Important work is well underway in every division across the university, whether in the areas of governing and governing council, the student experience and access opportunities, whether we're looking at the employee life cycle, including uh, recruitment and retention, whether looking at faculty teaching, curriculum development, and in research, critical action is being taken to increase equitable and inclusive practices. And I invite you to continue to see the commitments that are in progress, that are um, currently underway on the commitments webpage within the Division of People Strategy, Equity, and Culture. Areas such as the Division of University Advancement, under the leadership of Vice President David Palmer, continue to engage in the important work in engaging its members to chart a pathway forward in this critical time, including, uh, including uh, within the divisions would be that under the leadership of Vice President Kelly Hannah Moffitt, we will continue to support the university in meeting its commitments and in holding ourselves accountable to this important journey. As we continue to live through the most unprecedented of times, I implore each of us I implore all of you to hold on to community that much tighter and give selflessly of your kindness and compassion. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you, Jody, for those remarks. And thank you for leading an exceptional team of EDI professionals and for the work that your office continues to do. I do know, however, that in spite of all this hard work, and the work of the BIPOC community, support from others is still needed. Martin Luther King Jr. and educator and activist Jane Elliott recognized that support and advocacy from allies are needed for the BIPOC community to reach the potential it fully deserves. Please take a look at this short video featuring these two pioneers.
for many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens. If you, as a white person, would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. <laughs> you enjoyed that short video and we showed that video basically um, to celebrate those people like Jane Elliott who are true allies and advocates. Jane is in her 80s and I think she still continues to do, she's active in advocating and doing the work of an ally. And for the students out there, uh, I'd like to remind you that the idea of being, being an ally as it represents you maybe in high school at this moment is Basically to say, if you see something that you think is not right, say something. If one of your friends in school is bullying someone else, say something either to your teacher, but do not be afraid to say something if you see something. Over the years, we have had some outstanding award recipients. Two of these recipients join us today to convey their best wishes to the lunch on our 20th anniversary. Please, please listen to the Member of Provincial Parliament, Scarborough, Gilwood, Mitzi Hunter, and to the Senior Executive Vice President of Social Impact, Growth Initiatives, and Legislative Affairs of the NHL, Kimberly Davis, as they bring us greetings. Hello everyone, I am Mitzi Hunter, MPP for Scarborough Guildwood and two-time U of T alum. As a past recipient of the Black History Month Lunch Achievement Award, I would like to say congratulations to the Black History Month Lunch on reaching this remarkable 20th anniversary milestone. I would also like to say congratulations and welcome to this special club, to this year's award recipient, Andre de Grasse. To the organizers, volunteers, and everyone involved, please keep up your amazing work, continue to inspire, and I wish you continued success. As a past BHML Achievement Award recipient, I would like to say congratulations to the lunch on reaching this remarkable 20th anniversary milestone. I would also like to say congratulations and welcome to this special club, this year's award recipient, Andre de Grasse. To the organizers, volunteers, and everyone involved, please keep up the amazing work and I wish you continued success. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Mitzi, for those kind congratulatory remarks. I remember well the lunches that featured both of you as guests of honor. Kim, last year, uh, or the last year that we were, we were here, um, which now I'm confused because it's, it was last year in the, in the pandemic, and Mitzi, who was here with us in 2018. Our next presenter was with us last year. Since then, he has been appointed the first Poet Laureate of Ontario. He has graciously accepted our invitation to return this year and to perform some selections of his spoken word poetry. 
please welcome Ontario Poet Laureate Randell Ajay. Hi, my name is Randell Ajay. I am a spoken word artist, an author, community leader, and the founder of Rise Edutainment. I, last year, was appointed as Ontario's first Poet Laureate. And for me, it's a tremendous honor to be in this position, to represent Ontario uh, as a poet and as an artist. My main goals are to advocate for arts and culture across our province, whether it be through policy and government and in education. Uh, but my biggest goal is raising literacy uh, among our young people, that literacy is not necessarily something you know, to, to that just has to be a matter of essays and textbooks, but literacy is also in poetry. Literacy is also in music. It's in the arts and how we express ourselves. And so I wanted to ensure that I could use this platform to educate young people and really use a, the, the methodology of edutainment. So as they're learning, they're being entertained, and as they're being entertained, they're learning as well. Today, my presentation is short with three poems. The first two poems are called Stolen Tongue and Crossing Open Seas. The context for these first two poems is that I remember when I was younger, after being born in Canada and raised in Ghana for the first five years of my life and coming back to Canada, despite the fact that I spoke better English than all the other students in my class, despite the fact that I was getting student of the month every other month, I was put in, I was put in ESL because of my accent. And at that time, it was really detrimental because it, it really struck my confidence down. It made me feel like who I was wasn't good enough, like I had to assimilate. And I think Canada does a great job of teaching us that in order to belong, we have to assimilate and leave a little bit of who we are behind to be able to belong and to feel like we are accepted in this country. So I wrote this because my ancestors didn't speak English. Uh, they didn't understand the concept of English when they, when they thought of me. Um, and I just wanted to pay, pay homage to my ancestors and my, my language, which is Ga. Uh, being from Ghana. And the second poem has to do with the journey that our ancestors took from the continent to the many different places that we've been scattered, uh, to the Caribbean, the Americas, Europe, of course. And I just wanted to make sure that I could pay homage to the waters and the journey that our ancestors took. This colloquial tongue I speak is foreign to my ancestors who spoke me into existence. I am a descendant of a bloodline that was scattered across the ocean, this once foreign tongue used to oppress me. It is the stolen tongue I now use to speak of my oppression, a language used to abuse and defy my nature, a system designed to wipe out my ancestral imprint with ignorance, a tool misused to propel the exploitations inflicted upon me. Used to divide and conquer. Used in a court of law I was then forced to honor. Laws of a stolen land are now used to govern stolen people, displaced on native soil. See, the English language can be oppressive in its very nature. It thrives on individualism and domination, but these words do not exist in my mother tongue. I come from a land that speaks in hollow drums and heartbeats, resurrected by our redemption songs of love and prophesied descendants. See, the English language may have colonized the borders of my tongue, but Mama Africa still lives in each breath of my lungs. Because if the ocean waves could speak, would they still remember stories of our ancestry? Do the ripple effects of colonialism still linger across the Atlantic? Have the ancestors who were once swallowed whole by its gaping mouth become one with the sea? Did the oceans make us mermaids in Atlantis? Does each tide wade like long lost memories? Do the shores remember the ebb and flow of dark and shackled feet? Do the shores still remember us as kings and queens? Or do the waters continue to baptize and save us in the name of colonialism? Thank you. I hope those two poems gave you something to think about, something to explore. Uh, the last poem I shared, Crossing Open Seas, I remember being in Ghana at Elmina Castle, which was one of the first castles that were first taken over by the Dutch, the Portuguese, and then later the British, which they used um, to enslave my people and take us wherever they decided to take us. And I remember thinking of the water, like the water has so much memory. The water is angry there, to be honest. If you go to Cape Coast in Ghana, you'll notice the water is very angry. And so that really inspired me to write that poem and just to pay, pay homage uh, to, you know, to what's been done. Thank you, Rand Randell, and uh, congrats on your new appointment and um, good luck as you go forward in your career.
And there's more spoken word from Randell later in the program. Tatiana Ali is an actress and a singer. As a singer, she was once signed to Will Smith's label and made the charts earlier in her career. As an actress, we know her best as a member of the cast of the iconic TV show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. She sat down with us for a Q&A session earlier on. And please watch this. Welcome, Tatiana Ali. Thank you, Tatiana, for taking the time to answer a few questions for the Black History Month luncheon at the University of Toronto. So, let's start at the beginning. Your show, The Iconic Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, was groundbreaking in many regards, not the least of which was how inspirational and aspirational the show was. My question is, did your younger self have a sense of its impact? And also, now that you look back, what are your thoughts on that aspect of the show? I didn't uh, know the impact that it would have. I don't think any of us did. I think we were really excited to be doing, you know, something that was such a big deal, you know, a network, a show on NBC. Um, I know that we, I know for me anyway, it felt like something special because of all of our relationships, because of how we just gelled when we first met. It was hard work, but it was so much fun and we laughed so much. And I think that that sense of family and, and what they call in our industry chemistry, um, I think that's palpable to the audience to this day and that's, that's part of the success of the show. But um, the cultural impact, I had no idea. I did know that a rapper starring in a television show was brand new at that time. And people had questions about it. It was strange, that was strange. Nobody knew how that would turn out. Um, luckily that rapper was Will Smith. So, uh, and I think anything he was a part of would be destined to be successful. Um, but that leap of faith, culturally, you know, um, this, this affluent black family that the story is about, the fact that hip hop was a part of the show, um, I think that was really forward thinking. And I think a lot of the things that really move the needle culturally, um, you'll, you'll, you'll find that, you'll find the, that it's, there's a risk that's being taken. Um, and you always wanna do that in your, in your work and in your art, you wanna take risks um, because that's where the greatest rewards are. And I think that's what's happened with the show. How I feel about that is that I, I feel just incredibly blessed to be in part of something that has meant so much to people's lives personally um, uh, and, and also culturally. One, I love acting and I want to know how to get an urgent. Um, the thing about the performing arts is that you just have to perform and start where you are locally, um, your school, uh, your community theater, really work on honing your craft. If there is an acting school that you want to be a part of, that's a great way to start. Start surrounding yourself with other artists. Um, the community of artists where you are and all of those um, all of those activities will get you access to the next step and the next steps sort of reveal themselves naturally and you want to make sure that when you have the opportunity to be in front of a manager or to be in front of an agent that you are prepared and preparation in the arts has everything to do with rehearsal and practice. You have to hone your craft so that when that opportunity does arrive, you're ready for it. Tatiana, uh, we are from the Nook Children's Program and we have some questions. My question is, how long did it take to make it? Well, a show like that, a sitcom, it took us one week to make one episode. 
that starts with the table reading. That's the first time that we all sit down together, all the cast members and all the writers and producers, a big room of people, we sit down at a big table and we would read the show with all of the jokes um, and make sure that everything made sense. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we'd rehearse, 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 like a play. And we'd rehearse on the set, um, the writers would come down, we would do run-throughs for them is what they're called, which means, you know, we'd go through the show as if we were really taping it. And uh, we could still have our scripts then, we didn't have to be memorized. And the writers would take notes, they would make changes, um, and that would happen again and again until the show was as funny and as great as it could be. And then Friday, Friday night was our big night where the audience would come in, we would have um, a DJ to keep everybody really excited and happy, and we'd do the show. And so all of the laughter that you hear on Fresh Prince, there are actually a couple hundred people watching the show and, and laughing. Um, so yeah, it took one full week to make each one of those episodes. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, just to note that there will be a part two of this interview questionnaire with uh, Tatiana later on in the program. <clears throat> David Palmer is the vice president of the Division of University Advancement, and he has been a friend and supporter of the luncheon over the years. More recently, David has demonstrated exemplary leadership qualities in responding to one of the defining social issues of recent times, the issue of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I work in this division, and I know for a fact that he has led on this issue brilliantly. Not only that, and he will speak to this later, he has taken the lead role in establishing the, the Black History Month Luncheon Fund, which he will give a few more details later on. His traditional role at the luncheon is to introduce the guest speaker and the presentation of the award. And so now I would like to welcome David Palmer, the Vice President of Advancement at the University of Toronto to make a special announcement and to introduce our guests of honor, David. Well, thank you, Glenn, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the many students and staff and faculty and community members who are watching remotely. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I know we'd all like to be together, as Glenn mentioned earlier, for this annual celebration and highlight in our calendar. But wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying your lunch and today's event. I also want to add my thanks to all the staff from U of T Advancement who contribute to the event's success, in particular, the members of the organizing committees at our three campuses. But I also want to give a special shout out to Glenn himself, Glenn Booth, one of the stalwart social organizers who began this event 20 years ago. Glenn, here we are celebrating 20 years of this wonderful event, a remarkable achievement and an inspiration to so many of us. Glenn, I don't know whether you ever envisioned that it would grow this large. It would feature such an impressive list of honorees or indeed be broadcast internationally to our alumni community. So congratulations on this tremendous success to you and to all members of the organizing committee. This year, as President Gertler announced in celebration of the 20th anniversary of this luncheon and in recognition of the work of the Black History Month Luncheon Organizing Committee, the university has created the Black History Month Luncheon Fund. This endowed scholarship fund will provide essential financial aid for black undergraduate students. Now I'm pleased to let you know that the university has created a matching fund of up to $50,000 for individual donors. And I do encourage all of you to visit the funding page to learn more and to donate. Your support, regardless of size, matters significantly here. It will go a long way in making the scholarship fund an outstanding success. Now I'm I believe you can find the link to the fund in the chat. You can also find the link to the silent auction items, proceeds of which will also go to benefit the Black History Month Luncheon Scholarship Fund. Now, as with past years, I have had the privilege of formally welcoming our guest of honor. Over time, this privilege has given me a chance to meet such luminaries 
as Masai Ujiri, George Eliot Clark, Mitzi Hunter, and Kimberly Davis, both of whom we just heard from again, Mark Saunders, and the Honorable Jean Augustine. And this year, it is my honor to welcome Andre de Grasse, Canadian sprinter and philanthropist. Together with Andre, uh, in accepting this award today, on behalf of Andre, is his mother, Beverly de Grasse. With six Olympic medals, Andre de Grasse is the most decorated male Olympian in Canadian history. He captured medals in all three sprint events at both the 2016 Rio Olympics and again five years later at the Tokyo Olympics. He's the reigning Olympic champion in the 200 meter, winning gold in 2021 after winning silver behind Usain Bolt in 2016. Completing the trifecta, he is also a two-time bronze medalist in both the 100 meter and the four by 100 relay events. Off the track, Andre is a proud father raising three children with his partner, Nia Ali, the reigning world champion in the women's 100 meter hurdles and an Olympic silver medalist. In addition to his responsibilities as a family man and being an author of children's books, Andre inspires youth through the work of the Andre de Grasse Family Foundation. The foundation empowers young people by providing access to sport, education, and health care, including mental health supports. Today, Andre, we would like to add to your collection of awards and accolades. Now, I have here the Advancement Achievement Award itself. And just before I pass this award off to Beverly to accept on Andre's behalf, I thought I would read the inscription to you. It says, presented to Andre de Grasse for his inspiring contributions to and continued excellence in Canadian high performance sport, for empowering youth to use sport as a platform to further their academic potential, and for being a distinguished role model to our students through his achievements and community engagement. And now it is my great pleasure to present the Advancement Achievement Award to your mother, Andre Beverly de Grasse. Beverly. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm really honored to accept this award on behalf of my son, Andre. I must admit, at times I was listening to your citation and I almost did not recognize that you were talking about my son. As a parent, you sometimes forget that people have a different view, especially when your son is a public figure. Having talked to Andre about this, I know he's honored and excited to receive this award. He's honored because he looks at the list of past recipients historically for our community like Jean Augustine and realize that she represents historically for our community as the person who introduced the Black History Month legislation in the Canadian Parliament. Excited because he sees someone like Masai as a past recipient and that takes him back to his Raptors fan days when he wanted to be Vince Carter rather than Usain Bolt. I myself look at these names and I see a tradition of Black achievement and Black excellence. As a mom, I must say I feel joy that my son is being recognized as being part of this tradition of achievement and excellence, and that this will always be a part of his legacy. I might even go so far as to say I'm even prouder of this award than he is, but not by much. I learned today that over 20,000 kids signed up for this event. That's a phenomenal number. Those are Drake concert numbers, I believe. But for all the students who have signed up for this, please note that Andre believes in you and that part of his motivation to work hard is knowing that all of you believe in him and I want him to, and want him to succeed. He knows that you too can achieve success and excellence by working hard. This award reads, for his inspiring contributions to and continued excellence in Canadian high performance sports, for empowering youth to use sports as a platform to further their academic potential, and for being a distinguished role model to our students through his achievement and community engagement. 
While the award rightly captured his idea of continued excellence in Canadian high performance sports, it also captures another significant, significant part of who he is and what he values. Empowering youth to use sports. This aligns with what the DeGrasse Family Foundation does, and this is what makes it so special. Andre might have dreamed of Olympic gold, but I do not think he ever dreamed of being recognized by the University of Toronto for these for contribution and for that he is humbled. In closing, on behalf of Andre, I would like to say a big thank you to everyone involved in this warm and celebratory event. Thanks to the Chancellor and the President and to the organizer, organizer and the university staff, students and community. Thanks to everyone who attend for all the, from all the various organizations. Finally, a big thank you for my son for allowing me to accept this award on his behalf. It was an honor to be here today and thanks again. Thank you, Beverly. And on behalf of all of us here, I'd like to welcome both you and Andre to the University of Toronto family, and Andre to the, as the latest member of the Black History Month Luncheon Award, Achievement Award recipients. Thank you again for doing this. I would also quickly like to thank David Palmer. I know he hates when we thank him for doing anything, but the fact that he has done his part with his team and the senior management team in establishing this luncheon fund is a big achievement. It is a big deal because there are students out there listening to us today who will probably benefit from what this award, scholarship award will offer. So thank you for that. Now, I know Beverly has agreed to have a quick conversation with us, answer a few questions. Um, unfortunately, uh, Andre could not join us right at this moment. Um, he's in intense training for the upcoming season. And the plans were that, depending on how that session went, he would have joined us. But I did say to his mother that we will not stand in the way of the next gold medal. So he's excused for this once. But we're going to hold him accountable for being with us next year when we do have it live. So he's not totally off the hook. So. Beverly, let's, since we have you, we'll start with a few questions for you. And firstly, I would like you to share with us what it means to be a proud mother of his son who has had such a remarkable career. Well, Glenn, to be honest with you, it took me a while to come to terms with the fuss everyone makes about my son. Someone I obviously nurtured from my womb to adulthood. Eventually, I now have to accept that in some ways people find him special. But you know, as a parent, the most you want for your kids is their success and whatever they do. The fact that his success is somewhat more high profile probably adds to my pride a little bit. But I know I would have been proud of anything he became a success at. Thanks. Okay, another question for you. Aside from people like me bothering you to do interviews, how has Andre's success changed your life? So first of all, I would like you to know your interview requests are not a bother. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to represent him, especially accepting such a prestigious award on his behalf. So as Andre would say, I can go with the flow. 
There have been some changes in my life. Firstly, he has made me a grandmother to two beautiful grandchildren that I am so proud of dearly. There's also the distance between us. He lives and trains in Florida, so it makes it more difficult for us to see each other. I guess it might be the same from many of you students that had to move away from home for university. But the one change that I appreciate the most is a platform his success has given us to create the Andrew deGrasse Family Foundation. This is very important to both of us because it allows us to help high school athletes utilize their full potential. Some athletes who otherwise may, would not be able to afford club expenses. You see, I remember when Andre made his first junior Pan American team at 17. Several expenses came with that team trip that I could not afford at the time. A good Samaritan paid his full expense. For that, I'm very grateful. It is something I always remember. So now we both have the op opportunity to pay it forward. Thank, thank you for that, Charles. I'm still not done with you yet. We have a third, another question here for you if you're ready for us. Um, and this is a question that I chose because it's, um, it's, it's, it's pertinent to my culture and with my Jamaican background. So I know that you're a Trinidadian and there's a friendly rivalry between the Trinidadians and the Jamaican sprinters. So we're gonna we're gonna settle that um, we're gonna settle that today between yourself and myself. Some Jamaican sprinters lay claim to the Jamaican yam as one source of their sprinting prowess. Can you share with us which Canadian or maybe which Trinidadian food is Andre's source of speed? Finally. Well, I was a decent sprinter myself in, in time, so I would like to think maybe it's perhaps my genes rather than the food. However, if I had to say food, growing up, he visited yearly as a child in Trinidad, so he fell in love with the traditional East Indian cuisine like curry and roti. As he grew older, he fell in love with Jamaican dishes such as jerk chicken, oxtail, and rice and peas. No Jamaican yam, so. I cannot say for sure if the curry and the roti help with his speed. I do know for sure that throughout his childhood, we both enjoy home cooked meals. And we ate at home, and I always ensure that he ate his vegetables. So maybe it were the vegetables. So to all kids out there, eat your vegetables. And I must say, he still enjoys my home cooked meal. All right, thank you, Beverly. I think you um, you should be a diplomat. I think the way you answered that, neither the Jamaicans or the Trinidadians can be, or the East Indians can be unhappy because you pretty much um, stayed right down the middle there. So it's still not settled. <laughs> uh, aside from sprinting, what is the one thing about Andre that you're proud of? In raising Andre, the one word that was a big part of the vocabulary in my household was respect. I was firm about him maintaining that value always. I think that perhaps is where he has gotten some of the humility and general good nature. I remember it was during the Pan American Games in Toronto in 2015. There were so many children wanting to take a picture with him. And as tired as he was, he stood there smiling and taking all the pictures in the world. Even with all his success, this has not changed him. Andre has remained friends with two of his high school friends to this day. He has maintained his relationship from his large extended family of aunts, uncles, cousins, and they are very proud of his success. Thank you, Beverly. And I think you've answered one of the questions for me in terms of how or why he stayed so humble, or he's just not your typical 100 meter sprint champ in the way he, his posture and his demeanor, his really, really um, humble demeanor. And now I know the answer. It's because he's scared of you. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Here's my fifth question for you. Was there that one 
eureka moment when it hit you that Andre was going to do big things? Well, when Andre was growing up, I did not see him as becoming Canada's top sprinter. His first coach, Tony Sharp, had always told me that he would do great things. Andrew was involved in many sports as a young child and had always excelled. The Eureka moment for me, however, was winning the NCAA championship in 2015. Two gold medals at the Pan American Games and two bronze medals at the World Championship in Beijing. This is when I truly began to believe that there was something special in the making. A young man so filled with dreams and hope of becoming an NBA basketball player was about to do something big in track and field. My final question for you, Nibi, you look relieved already. Um, what goes through your mind as you sit in the stands watching Andre compete? I have so many mixed emotions as I sit in the stands watching my son compete. Firstly, there are nerves and anxiety, especially because I want him to succeed. Luckily, he handles his nerves much better than I do. He's such a fierce competitor and I know he wants to win. Secondly, I pray that he would finish healthy. But the most important thing that goes through my mind and how proud is how proud I am of him in everything he has accomplished and his success to this day. Thank you so much, Beverly, for sitting down and having the patience uh, to take those questions for us today at the luncheon. You're welcome. And again, welcome to you and your son to the University of Toronto family. Thank you so much, Glenn. Andre did sit down with us earlier to answer a few questions himself. Um, he was very gracious with his time. And now I'd like to have you have a look at this session conversation that we had with Andre. We're delighted to have with us today our guest of honor, six-time Olympic medalist and newest recipient of the University of Toronto's Black History Month Luncheon Advancement Achievement Award, Andre de Grasse. Andre, welcome, and thank you for taking the time out to have a conversation with us and to answer a few questions. So, my first question to you, Andre, is, now that you have had time to reflect a bit how does it feel to be a gold medalist black athlete? And what does that mean to you? Yeah, um, for me, I feel like winning a gold medal was great, you know, great for the country, great for my community. But I really just try to go out there and represent my nation, represent my country to the best of my abilities, and just really just go out there and have fun. So definitely that was a big moment for me to be able to win a gold medal, and now I'm gonna to try to do my best to continue to really inspire and empower the next generation moving forward. And you know, that's, that's my goal with, with the Andre de Grasse Family Foundation. What do you think it means to the black community? And what do you think it means for Canadians in general? I think it's a, good, a great moment. Um, of course, you know, Black History Month is always about celebrating um, you know, black athletes, black actors, um, Every, everybody, everybody, all the stuff that's, you know, we've been through in, in the past, you know, the past year. So definitely just, you know, me and me being an inspiration to them is a great feeling. And I want to just be able to continue to really just continue to inspire my community and continue to really just inspire that next generation of, uh, of athletes or of individuals in general. Having reached this level of success, what motivates you to continue to compete? And as you train each year, what do you focus on to remain competitive? Yeah, I feel like what motivates me to continue to run is that um, I want to be able to continue, you know, breaking records, um, winning medals, um, just trying to just create that legacy for myself um, to be the best athlete um, that I can be uh, and, you know, be talked about among other, in the, other, um, other people in the future. So, yeah, that's something that I just always just try to push myself and strive for greatness every single day um, to, you know, push past my limits and just take it as far as I, I can. I focus on a lot to be to be competitive, um, you know, whether that's, you know, my nutrition, my hydration, uh, making sure that I'm being competitive coming out the blocks. Um, all these things help me, you know, become the best version of myself. Um, and as I get older, I've realized now that 
Uh, sleep comes into comes into play a lot more. So definitely, I work on a lot of things throughout throughout the years. But you know, I have to continue to adjust so that I can continue to be competitive. Talk to us about the importance of your community work, and also the importance of the work of your foundation. Yeah, my community work is very very important to me. Uh, it's close to my heart. Something that I very ch I cherish. I cherish a lot. Um, you know, that's why I kind of started the Andre DeGrasse Family Foundation. Uh, I wanted to continue to give that support to young young kids and continue to help them uh, with their education and mentorship so that they can be, uh, you know, the best individuals that they possibly can. So definitely, uh, I'm looking forward to doing more work with that um, as the time as the year goes on. Um, and we've done so much great work during the pandemic, and I want to just continue to really just keep that keep that focus and keep that uh, that inspiration up uh, as we come out of this. Um, this pandemic. So you must be aware that you have lots of fans who are in high school and elementary school. So we have a few questions from some of those um, students. Here's one for you, Andre. I've heard that you're good at almost everything that you try to do. But can you also rap and dance? And who is your favorite music artist? Um, <laughs> I don't I don't think I'm good at everything, but I definitely, um, you know, try new things. Um, that's always something that I was taught at a young age to just give, give something a try and see if you're if you're good at it or not. So that's what I've done with sports. And as you can say, maybe rapping and dancing, I've done a little bit of that. But I just have some fun, you know, go with the trends, go with the flow, um, you know, go work with it. I, I see that's the new the new wave with TikTok and everything. So just trying to have fun out there and, and be myself and, and, and enjoy. So uh, definitely, that's what I always try to try to just tell people. Just continue to you know be yourself and, and always try new things. As a kid, were you able to get away from your mother when she tried to catch you to dish out some punishment? Definitely couldn't outrun my mom <laughs> uh, when I was younger. You know, of course, you know um, anybody who knows. Um, you know, when you have a Caribbean Caribbean parents. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, if you know, um, but yeah, I definitely couldn't outrun, outrun her. So definitely uh, couldn't outrun those punishments, but uh, they were all worth it. It made me into the man who I am today. So definitely it was good to, it built a very good character and good discipline on me. <laughs> Here's another question from one of the students. Do you think if you really practice really hard, you could also be the fastest skater ever? Wow, um, I do like skating. Um, you know, more and more on the rollerblading side, inside, inside the rink. I haven't really done, you know, any ice skating as of recently um, since I was a kid, but I, you know, I do a little bit of roll, rollerblading uh, here and there. So may, maybe, maybe I'm, I could be fast if I practice a little bit. So definitely uh, got to take you up on that challenge. <laughs> okay, so we do have a few more questions for you, Andre. Here's one. Who is your role model or inspiration? I feel like my inspiration growing up was Tony Sharp. Um, you know, he got me into the sports. He nurtured me. He, you know, made sure that I was on the right path um, when I was, you know, getting my education and, you know, choosing the right school and, you know, just trying to get, you know, get ready for uh, a world championship or an Olympic game. So I definitely felt like, you know, he was the guy that always I can always, you know, go to for advice, uh, for, you know, a little bit of mentorship. So. Uh, it's really good that I've had him growing up in my life because he definitely made a difference uh, in my life and just being a good inspiration and role model for me. We know you are a huge basketball fan, but is there an athlete you admire regardless of the sport and why? Yeah, I feel like um, you know one of my favorite athletes growing up as a kid was Vince Carter. Uh, I grew up a big Toronto Raptors fan, um, so I loved watching him play. Um, in the ACC at the time, uh, now you know now it's the Scotia Bank Arena, but it's Air Canada Center, and just watching him play and watching him, you know, make noise, and you know that was kind of the guy that I was like, you know, I kind of modeled my game a little bit after and wanted to be like. So, uh, you know, my my number was number 15 on my basketball team. So definitely just uh, you know having you know seeing him play definitely was a huge inspiration to me uh, growing up playing basketball, and uh, that was one of the guys that you know. I kind of just modeled my game after and as well as another player uh, that comes to my mind that I just got that, um, you know, the cornrows from was, was Allen Iverson. So I would say Vince Carter and Allen Iverson were the two guys that, you know, that, that gave me that, that look. <laughs> they say that the Olympic experience is not all about competing. 
Aside from winning the medals, please share your favorite Olympic moment or moments. I think my favorite Olympic moment outside of just winning my medals is that, um, you know, just being able to bond and have that camaraderie with my teammates, being able to be in the village and just, you know, enjoy, have fun, soak in the atmosphere, uh, you know, just being able to see other people uh, perform and, you know, you know, see all my other teammates from different, from different sports because, you know, you never really get a chance to really see or do or do that. So, I mean, just me being able to just, you know, be in that moment be with my teammates and, you know, cheer them on. That was really exciting for me. Another person would like to know, what are some of the favorite cities or countries that you have visited during the course of competing? Uh, I would say my favorite city is Monaco. Here's another kid's question. What is the hardest part about being an Olympic athlete? Uh, I feel like the hardest part about being an Olympic athlete is you have to wait every four years to be able to compete again at the Olympics. So, you know, just having that build up and that weight uh, is always the toughest part, but you just really just try to, you know, continue to try to build momentum and, you know, hopefully, you know, in the future, you know, might not have to wait that long, you know, maybe only wait two years. <laughs> this question is from our University of Toronto Scarborough campus, and they would like to know, what opportunities did you wish you had when you were younger? In retrospect, is there anything about your younger self that you would have changed? No, I don't think necessarily there's anything about my younger self that I would change. I feel like everything that I've been through uh, in my life and in my career has made me to be who I am today. So definitely just going through all the emotions and everything that I've been through has helped me become a better person, a better individual, a better father, um, and all those things combined. So definitely I think all the things I've been through has helped me in my quest to being, you know, being the best version of myself. <clears throat> Here's another question. How do you and your partner manage to successfully blend being parents while also being competitive athletes? Yeah, I think my partner and I, my partner and I, Nia, uh, we just be able to find balance. Uh, you know, we know that, you know, we try to set a schedule. We know, we know we have the kids, we have our competition, but we just try to come up with a plan that, you know, makes us successful, but makes both of us successful, and we go from there. But I think just me basically just writing down stuff um, and basically just trying to balance um, all our commitments, uh, and that's how we kind of just, you know, go with the flow uh, of that. So, yeah, I mean, of course it's tough, but, you know, we get through it and we figure things out sometimes on the go, and sometimes, you know, we have a, you know, we have a plan as well. Okay, so here's a question about your kids. Are any of your kids showing early signs of sprinting prowess? And would you support them if they made that career choice? Yeah, I mean, my kids are very energetic. Um, you know, they could be track stars, maybe. But um, for me, as a parent, um, it's not something that I'm going to really push them towards as much. I think I just want them to, you know, do whatever that, do whatever that they want to do. Um, so for me, I just, you know, you know, go with the flow, um, you know, whatever that they they find interesting, um, I support them in whatever it is. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all I can really say about that. So, I mean, but if they do, if they do become track stars, of course, definitely I would, you know, of course I got to give them some tips. <laughs> Someone else would like to know, what do you do before a race to keep focused and to stay calm? And what do you think about during the race? Um, I just continue to really just have good mental preparation when I'm getting ready for my race. So I kind of really just really just distract myself, not really think about too much of the race. I know all the work is done. I've done everything that I possibly can. So now I just got to go out there and be myself and have fun. So I just really just kind of like distract myself by listening to music, watching a little bit of TV, Netflix here and there. Um, and then just really basically just hanging out with my crew and just uh, enjoying the atmosphere and letting it all sink in. So. I'm not really thinking about the race until I actually get to the track. So that kind of really just helps me in my mental preparation um, as I'm moving forward and getting ready for my race. Oh, here's one that I like. Would you say you're a mama's boy? Share with us the bond that you have with your mom. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like, you know, my mom plays a big role in my career. Um, so definitely, I've always, she's always been very supportive of me, anything I need, um, you know, whether that's in my life, career-wise, she's there to help me and support me along the way. So I guess if that considers me a mama's boy, that's, uh, 
<laughs> that's what it is. But yeah, I mean, I just try to go out there. My mom's always been there for me through the ups and downs in my life. So definitely I always, you know, come to her for advice and she's always very encouraging and, you know, puts, keeps me on the right path. Here's a question about your acting skills. Someone would like to know, are those GoDaddy commercials really fun to make? Um, yeah, I enjoy doing the GoDaddy commercials. Um, I have a lot of fun doing it. It's kind of one of my first kind of gigs acting uh, where I had to run and say lines. So I definitely enjoy doing that and you know, I hope to keep you know, doing something like that in the near future So uh, when I'm done running. So definitely look out for that. <laughs> So here's a question that was also on my mind. Your reputation for being calm under pressure is the stuff of legend. I think all of Canada, myself included, probably had a national cardiac moment from the excitement of you winning gold. But looking back, you weren't as excited as seeing some other athletes after winning gold. Could you tell us how you were really feeling in that moment when you realized you had won gold? Yeah, in that moment when I won gold, I felt really good. Uh, all my hard work had paid off. Um, you know, just basically being able to go to the games. Uh, I was super grateful because I didn't know if it was going to happen or not. So just everything was, was, was right in that moment. Um, you know, I felt so many different emotions um, that went through my head. And, and it's really hard to put into words and context of, of, of how I really felt. But... It was just really a surreal feeling, and I was just super grateful and thankful that I was able to, you know, come away with the gold medal. Okay, thank you, Andre, for uh, taking the time out to have that conversation with us at the lunch here today. I know a lot of your fans would be uh, delighted, to, and there's a lot there for them to take away with. Also, another thank you to your mom for being here and accepting on your behalf. Uh, at this point, before the chancellor is a ceremonial head of the university. She, this chancellor acts as ambassador to UFT's alumni and the wider community. And the chancellor is a key advocate of the university on the local, national, and international level. The presence of the chancellor here today, like those of other senior members of the university, is another demonstration of the university recognizes, recognizing the importance of these events. Before I introduce the chancellor to say the closing remarks and thank you remarks, I'd like to quickly share a story that even the chancellor didn't remember this happening. At the last in-person lunch at Hart House Great Hall, I tried to escort the chancellor to the head of the food line to avoid the lineup, which was fairly long. She's the chancellor after all. The chancellor totally insisted that she did not want to be shown any preferential treatment, so she would prefer to stand in line. Of course, she's a chancellor, so I cannot fight with her. In the end, she, I did manage to get her out of the line with a fight and get her some food. But for me, that was a point I said to myself, I will have to have the chancellor back at every lunch, if possible, going forward. So when she was asked this year, I was delighted to hear her insisting that yes, she wanted to be part of the lunch. And I love to share with you that the chancellor is with us today and she's been with us for the whole duration of this event. And I thank her for that. I would now like to welcome Dr. Rose Patton, chancellor of the university. She's a former chair of governing council. She's also special advisor to the chief executive officer at BMO Financial Group. She's a longtime volunteer and champion of the university. Chancellor Patton will bring closing remarks on behalf of the university. Chancellor Patton. Yes, thank you, Glenn. And here I am. 
I'm hoping you all can hear me. And I want to first say what a great pleasure it is for me to be here again this year. And good afternoon to all of you. It also honors me to offer a few final remarks as chancellor and on behalf of the University of Toronto and our global alumni community. I want to start by thanking Andre de Grasse and Beverly de Grasse once again. It was wonderful to sit through and, and see your wonderful leadership. Your remarks today were inspiring and your interviews were both heartwarming and prideful and, uh, and just a, a wonderful to behold. I want to thank all our hosts, the Black History Month Committee and the Division of the University Advancement. The Black History Month luncheon has grown tremendously over the past two decades. It shows no signs of slowing down. This is due to the many volunteers who make it happen every year. And so let me thank you also. Because of your commitment, your time and your talent, the Black History Month luncheon has become a mainstay and a highlight in the University of Toronto calendar. It's always a joyful culmination of our celebration of Black History Month. The fact that this tradition has continued so vibrant during COVID-19 pandemic, even though we've not been able to gather in person, it's a testament to its importance to the university and our partners in the wider community. And finally, to everyone who has joined us today, thank you for being here. And thank you for this wonderful gathering and for your contributions to the life and to the mission of the University of Toronto. Thank you all, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Chancellor Patton. And we do look forward to having you with us next year, live at Heart House, and maybe having some fried plantains with you. This concludes this portion of the show. However, I would like to say that there is a bonus section of entertainment section with part two of the Q&A with Tatiana Ali, part two of the poetry reading with Randell Ajay, and some more music. So don't go anywhere. Please stick around for this segment. And once again, thank you for staying with us this far. And I'd like to thank everyone involved with our calling, naming everyone. Thank you all who have participated and thank you for the students. We'll see you next year.
share a very quick story. I partnered I partnered on this project with Mark Stoddard, who's a mentor of mine, a big brother of mine. And we were both, just both talking about, you know, losing people in our lives and losing people that we care about and not having the opportunity to tell them how much they meant to us before they passed. So I was in Ghana in March of last year and my aunt who raised me, we tried to meet up and I know I could have made more of an effort, but when I came back to Canada, just two months later, I found out that she passed. And it was heartbreaking, you know, to think that I could have at least s spoke to her even one last time. And I wanted my experience to be something to remind us all that don't wait till it's too late. Do it now. So this is Flowers. One of the only things more difficult than death itself is to be forgotten. Or perhaps to plant like a seeds and never see your roses blossom to never unbox your gift before your coffin. We all deserve to be honored while we are still alive. To witness the budding gratitude of loved ones with open eyes, you deserve to be celebrated like you're already gone. To be given your flowers while they are still flourishing, while you can still smell the sweet scent of photosynthesis as your life branches out of the purpose you're rooted into and the fruits you've produced. So may I give you your flowers while they are still in bloom a bouquet package delivered and handed to you. In honor of the effervescent existence of your truth, may this be a reminder that your words and actions live on beyond being six feet and entombed. You are worthy of being handed yours while you are still alive, while you can still sniff the sweet fragrance blossom in time, a reminder of how you bloomed before you were called to tomb, from darkness to light, how you pass on the baton for the next generation to take flight, a relay race of time between the lines of from and to, the legacy of how you actualize into truth. You have the right to leave this earth knowing that your presence was appreciated, that it made a difference, that it meant something to someone while there's still air in your lungs. What would it look like to normalize honoring those who mean something to us before they transition so that they never question our love while they're still living? It's easy to take our loved ones for granted when we are caught up in our day-to-days, but in the same breath, the next breath is never guaranteed to stay. So before the leaves fall off of their trees and they branch out and reach into the heavens, let them know that they are a blessing, that their mere essence was a gift. May death never be the reason you appreciate the fact they live. Thank you for listening. Thank you for um, indulging me <laughs> as well. Uh, that poem can be difficult sometimes to share, but it's a difficult reality because the reality is two things in life are inevitable. One day we will be born and one day we will leave. And it's not about the day we're born, nor is it about the day we leave. It's everything to do with the dash in between. And so as we take a moment to celebrate Black History Month, let's recognize that Black History Month is, is World History Month and uh, to continue to leave a legacy, that you have a gift in you, that you have something that was planted inside of your heart, your spirit, a purpose that you can use to make the world around you that much better. So thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And I wish you all an incredible, incredible, incredible day. Be well, bye. Black women in this cycle are now quite rightly, finally getting their kudos for the tremendous work 
that they have done and continue to do towards helping to create a just society. As a pioneering black woman, please share some of your thoughts on this. I think that a lot of the answer to the question is in the question it, it itself. Um, black women have been doing extraordinary work for throughout, throughout history, um, not just American history, throughout world history. And uh, um, whether that work is, you know, in our homes, in our communities, in the political sphere, in the sciences, uh, in the arts, I mean, you name it, black women have been a part of it. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that at the same time, there are others who would kind of cloud that history and uh, make us believe that we are less than or less capable or, um, uh, you know, of less value. Um, I've been really uh, uplifted by and proud to be a part of organizations like Black Girls Rock, which was founded by Beverly Bond. She actually coined the term Black Girl Magic. Um, to be a part of not, the, not a renaissance of, you know, what the work black women are doing, but a renaissance in the way that we talk about the work that black women are doing um, as change agents in our culture and in our various industries. Um, it's just a fact. And so, you know, part of what I've spent some of my time in my life doing in my career, in my speaking and in my mentorship work has really been to show uh, black girls um, and others um, the history that actually exists that they are not um, blazing new trails they are they are gonna blaze new trails but they stand on the shoulders of giants who have come up against some of the same discrimination and even and even worse I want uh, girls to know um, black girls and black boys, as a black woman, I want them to know um, that they're capable of anything they set their mind to, that they're capable of anything they dream of, and uh, to not listen to the naysayers because they're lying. Do you enjoy watching the show by, like when you're not acting? I do. When I was younger and I was making the show, I would watch it um, by myself, <laughs> my family would watch it in another room and I would go in a room and watch it by myself because I would get too embarrassed and kind of self-conscious to watch it with everyone. Um, but over the years, I've found it easier to watch myself and, um, and to not be as critical of my work. Um, I think anybody, any of us, you know, when you put your heart and soul into it, into something that you're doing and then you share it with others it can be embarrassing and it can be um you know it can make you feel self-conscious but it's really good to work on that and to really be proud of the work that you're doing do you still like acting i love acting and i i started acting when i was four years old and it's been a love affair of mine since then um, it's always different. You know, I get to be a part of different stories. I get to play different characters. Um, so it never gets boring. It's always different and it's always really challenging. You watch the show with your kids. And I do watch the show with my kids a little bit. My sons, I have two boys. Uh, one is five and one is two. And they kind of the, my older son is just starting to understand that that girl on TV is his mom. Um, he's just starting to understand that. But And my little one, I don't think he really gets that at all yet. But uh, when we do watch the show, we have a really fun time watching it. And, uh, and they laugh at all the jokes. So it's really fun that something that we did so long ago is still fun. fun. Thank you so much for asking me such thoughtful questions. And... Um, to all the kids who ask the questions, um, I just want to add that um, in addition to acting, what was really, really 
uh, important to me in my life was school. And when I would, um, when I would work on set and we would do those rehearsals that I was talking about earlier, I would have my script in one hand and I would have my textbooks in the other because as much as I love acting, um, I love education. I love reading. I love uh, learning about the world, learning about other people, history, science. Um, it's really changed my life. And, and even though I love acting, because of my education, I feel like I can do, even now, uh, as a grown-up, I feel like I can really do anything that I put my mind to. And I hope the same for you. Uh, God bless. I love you. And take care of yourselves. Take care of your families. Thank you. You're broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round. And you can't find the fighter. But I see it in you, so we're gonna walk it out.
one heart. Let's get together and feel alright. One love, one heart. Give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel alright. Let them all pass all day. Dirty remarks. There is one question I really. Is there a place for the hopeless sinner who has hurt all mankind just to ha, just to save his own? So we say it, say one love, one heart. Let's.
They're stuck in the world. What's up with this country? Everything I see in the news got me laying there all messed up, confused, and I can't get it out my head. It's flowing through my veins like oh, 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 oh. There's nothing like good love. There's nothing like love that unites us. But the way the world is going, this type of love and showing is just hate for each other. No more color division. No more fear to be different. Just be who you are. Be free with your love and let's all rebel as one. Yeah. 